So you started talking about that generation, and you mentioned uh, sexual depravity. I don't know if everybody is aware completely of uh, the deepest teachings about that generation. You know, we begin again. It was it was at the end of Breshit that all this, you know, is the prelude. You know, in chapter six, very short, um, you know, eight verses at the end of Breshit basically describes to us um, a situation that was just a bad craziness. <laughs> You know, a bad craziness. You had you had these um, bene Elohim. You know these these the uh, sons these of God. yeah and these yes. nephilim that are that are walking around. Are they actual angels that were thrown out? Are they people who think that they're better than other people? Is <laughs> also another opinion. And they're and they're around. And Hashem sees that their wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And every product of it of the thought of his heart was but evil always. One of the major questions that I don't really want to go to now because I want, I want to try to address it in, in our video this week, God willing. But like, what was this a surprise? You know, like, did Hashem not see this coming? How does that work exactly? You know, the whole concept of Hashem's regret, as it were, that, that uh, as if, you know, oh goodness, well, that's unfortunate. You know, this is, a, this is something that really has to be understood. So I want to dedicate some time to that, like, like I say, and maybe in the, in the video. But the, the concept is that in 10 generations from Adam to Noah, everything completely fell apart. And basically, all knowledge of, of Hashem was lost. And the, and the whole world became so totally hopeless mm -hmm. that, that Hashem decided that he had to do a restart. Yeah. How, do we, how do we even understand that? Well, I, the way I understand it, Rabbi, is we can actually sort of pinpoint, of course, Cain was the problem because much of, you know, much of the planet was uh, in whatever form it was. Uh, I think it was like one big, like a Pangea uh, before the flood, is that Enosh kind of led, uh, led us into, I, I would characterize it that Enosh, who, who was a son of, of Seth, and Seth, of course, was, was born to Adam and Eve, after they'd lost uh, Hevel, Abel. And if I understand the, the way that Enosh has explained is he sort of introduced organized religion in that he said, it, it tells us in the Torah, in this Parsha, or is it the previous Parsha, that this son of, of this grandson of Adam, in those days, men began to, and it's usually translated as um, call out the name of God. Began and actually, to, it doesn't right. mean that they began to, and it doesn't really. It what it really means is they they profaned the name of excellent. God. Excellent, that is such they, an excellent insight. Hechel, yeah, and the root of that yeah. is like chiloni, which means basically secular. And yeah, so the yeah. idea is that he that he basically was uh, basically taking God out of the picture altogether. Yeah, they created the they they decided that God had. Uh, created the world and then like clockwork, which which in many ways it does, except that he's completely in control of it always. Their their conception of it introduced by Enosh was that it was this giant, beautiful machine that that God had created, and he walked away and left it to run itself. And so so Enosh actually introduced the idea we can pray to God, but we can pray to the elements and to the planets and the creations, and it'll be the same thing. And one of, I don't remember the source, but it was interesting because they said that, and this is what happens when you introduced idolatry. Idolatry, interestingly, is also the first uh, of the Noahide laws against idolatry. When you fall prey to idolatry in a society, then it's like the, the dice, uh, not the dice, it's like a domino effect. When idolatry is introduced into the thinking, then, then all of the rest of the commandments begin to tumble. And so the thing, the problem with Enosh is that he was very charismatic and he began to, to teach the deep secrets that he knew and that he was, uh, then he was tempted by the opposite sex. And that's when, that's when the sexual immorality began to be, to be introduced, right? So last week, if, remember when we were talking about Halloween, um, I, what I wanted to stress was this concept of um, a certain kind of pagan, I called it divisionism, like looking at the world as 
as different powers, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened here. What you're describing is that somehow, in fact, Maimonides himself in, in his great philosophical work, he asks this very question. He says, how is it that if God himself fashioned Adam, he was his own handiwork? I mean, so they, Adam was a very great man. He was the greatest. And so they had a very special relationship. And surely that tradition was handed down from father to son. So how is it that in a mere 10 generations, all knowledge of the one true God was lost? And instead, like you say, they were worshiping all these different forces. Hechel, they began, he began to, to profane, to secularize the oneness of God. And instead they saw wind and stars and moon and everything became a separate, you know, in fact, Maimonides explains that in the beginning they began kind of like giving like um, homage to these forces because they were created by God. So they said, oh, these are God's emissaries. Well, then they deserve honor. Yeah. You know, if they're God created the stars, so then, you know. But then what happened was they made a switch and they started looking at them as independent, divided divisionism, as divided powers. And it all began as a, a, as a blow against the unity of Hashem.